What's up, Grinder School? This is Characters with the Grinder School short. Um, gonna talk a little bit today about um, a few of the factors, a few of the considerations involved with bet sizing. It's not gonna be a full video, um, so I'm not gonna cover everything. And there is actually a full length thing on this. It's part of the How to Master Six Max series that I did um, last summer. And you can find a full thing about bet sizing on there, but I wanna just go over a few really important factors for this short and then in my next short I'm going to do the practical application of it. I'm going to go over a few hands and sort of talk a bit about the factors that we've, that we've learned in this little presentation. Um, so the first thing, these are all just sort of considerations, they're not always going to apply but there are things that you should have an open mind to think about when you're considering what your sizing should be in a certain spot. So the first thing is obviously the texture of the board, the most obvious thing. Um, how wet or dry is the board? Um, a few reasons why this is important. Generally on dry boards, you know, we're not worried about offering awesome odds to draws because it's the case that most of the time when our opponent's behind on a dry board, um, he's really behind and he doesn't have a whole lot of potential for improving his hand. So we don't need to worry about what sort of price we give him as long as we don't give him an absurdly small price. So on a dry board we don't need to worry about making sure we've bet enough to make it unprofitable for him to just call and play fair fold with a draw or something. Whereas on a wet board when there are flush draws, you know, they're immediately getting like really like tempting um odds to continue because they're gonna make their hand by the river sort of like one in three times. So of course that plus implied odds is gonna is gonna mean that we're gonna need to bet a lot more for it for it to be a mistake for people to continue and stuff like that. So the wetness and dryness is important. We might want to make it closer to pot on a wet board just so people can continue with straight draws and flush draws really profitably against us and play fit or fold. Um, the other reason is that we want to build a pot more on a wet board. A lot of the time we need to get our money in the first couple of streets because it's going to get really scary and it could be that say we're betting aces um, on a 3 bet pot and it's something like queen 9-7 with two hearts and then you could get another heart or you could get like a an eight could come in the turn or a jack or something. These are scare cards and it just means that our opponent isn't as likely to stack off with the hands we want him to, such as like top pair and things like that. The stuff there's lots of combos of, so we need to be a bit careful. Elasticity, that's basically a concept about how likely is our opponent's range to change calling range. How likely is that to change based on our sizing? So a really elastic range is one that our sizing is really going to impact how wide or tight our opponent continues. So, we'd say a range is elastic if our opponent's always going to call, you know, like, say, half pot and less, but as soon as we start making it two-thirds of pot, he's going to be folding a huge amount of his range. So, you can imagine, like, the metaphor with the elastic band is very sort of stretchy, and it makes a lot of change to the size of it when you sort of stretch it out. If it's inelastic, it's basically a set shape, so you could bet pot or you could bet half pot, you're still going to get called by any pair and you're still going to get folds from any non-pair, something like that. You know, the kind of spot where we're c-betting and we want to make it a bit smaller um, because we think our opponent's range is inelastic, so we're risking sort of the minimum we need to risk just to fold out his air. So a c-bet's a good example of an inelastic range against a, you know, a fish or whatever. But then if the guy is really stationary with ace high, then it becomes a bit elastic and maybe we need to make it a bit more to make it fold out as ace highs because we're just planning on firing one street or something like that. So how strong is villain's calling range? So this is pretty important both when you're going for value and when you're going for bluff. So firstly for value, if we know our opponent just has loads of, it's a really uncapped range, he has lots of sets and two pair combos and just the way he's played the hand we think his range is strong and we have the nuts then it would make sense to bet a lot more because we're getting called by a strong range. Um, if villain's range is, calling range is really weak, you know, like the only worst hands we're getting called by are weak hands, say we're thin value betting second pair in the river or something. In that case it makes much more sm much more sense to make it smaller because we think that his range is going to be a bit elastic there if we make it a bit bigger. He's probably going to be folding his sort of second, third pair of hands. We want him to call with those because it's a thin value bet and we don't have that much ourselves. So we need to make it smaller, so perhaps that's why we make it a third pot in the river. So how strong his calling range is going to matter. Similarly when we're bluffing, if we're just bluffing because we think his calling range is like... Well say, say we have like jack high in the river. And we know that villain has a lot of missed draws, or like king high, queen high and ace high. We want to fold those out. Um, but we know that we don't need to bet very much to do that. So 
If the hands we're trying to fold out with a bluff are really weak hands, then the bluff can be small. On the other hand, if we're barreling someone and we're trying to get them to fold top pair in the river, and we're trying to rep a really strong range, then we might need to make it a lot bigger because no one's going to fold top pair for a really small bet. So yeah, planning stacks, it's important to, to size your bets as well based on the stack sizes. Now you can't always get it in when you're value betting, you can't always get it in when you're firing three as a bluff, but what you can do is say in three bet pots, squeeze pots, you know, where it's much more likely you're going to be able to get it in, you don't want to be leaving yourself pot and a half left on the turn where your jams are just going to fold out lots of hands and any other bets, if, you know, effectively a jam anyway, so you know your villain can find a fold more easily or whatever. It's much better to sort of plan out in those situations whether you're going to bet to get it all in and size your bets to get it all in in two streets or whether you're going to do that over the full three streets. And obviously your other factors are going to tie in there, particularly the wetness or dryness of the board. If the board's really dry then maybe three streets is a bit better. You know, you can get more value that way, you can get floated on the flop by betting only half paw, you know, maybe you can widen villain's calling range by getting them committed to the pot, but if on the other hand it's really wet, like we said, there's going to be loads of hands that are going to call a couple of streets, but the board might get really scary and we want to not offer really good odds to draw on such a wet board so we make it more. Um, finally, the last consideration that we'll talk about today is the inflection point and that's basically it's something to think about, like if you know your villain quite well um, you're going to get accustomed to sort of what sizes he he likes to call with certain hands and what sizes he doesn't. So the inflection point is basically say you're betting for value what's the maximum amount I can bet here while villain's range remains unchanged. So you want to get called by a wide range, you want to think about at what sort of point is he going to start to fold and what sort of you know vicinity of bet size is going to start to elicit a lot of folds from his range. And then when you've identified that you can sort of find the upper end before that inflection point and that's how you find your optimal bet size. So it's quite important to think about the inflection point as well. Um, you know, we'd love to overbet every flop against the station when we flop the nuts, and sometimes it might be good, or against the fish, but even fish have their inflection points, they might be a bit higher than that of regulars or nits, but you know, we probably can't get away with three times potting the flop unless the guy's a huge whale, because we'll have breached that inflection point and caused him to fold too much of his range. We always want to keep our opponent's range kind of wide, as wide as we can while still getting a good amount of money. Um, but you know, that's not to say that we always need to keep his range that wide. Say villain calls any amount with top pair at all, but then we can get him if we bet like half pot, we can get called by middle pair as well. In that case, we'd rather just be over betting for value and targeting the top pair part of his range. So sometimes we want to target a certain part of our opponent's range to call with that he's calling with, and so we target our sizing. We make our sizing based on that. So these are just general principles, they're not like, this is not a formula to how to size bets, they're just things that I think people don't think about enough when they're thinking about bet sizing, and in the next short I'm going to talk a bit about, well I'm going to go through a couple of example hands where I think the sizing is really important, and sort of link some of this in if possible. So thanks for watching, and please tune in next time, where I'll go over some practical examples. Thanks.